Stanford University. All right, uh, we're going to get started. This is lecture nine, if I'm kind of right, uh, of CS193G. Um, today we have another uh, guest speaker, actually the guest speaker from last time, kind of back by popular demand, uh, Nathan Bell from uh, NVU Research. Uh, and today he's going to be talking uh, about sparse matrix vector multiply operations. And you'll learn more than you ever wanted to know about how to do SwimV really fast and efficiently on GPUs, which is good because it sounds like it kind of that's the core operation of several of your projects. So with that, it's Mel. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so today we'll be talking about uh, sparse matrix vector multiplication, and uh, we this is a, a title from our, our paper, and it's instead of just GPUs, we said throughput oriented processors, and the idea being that the approach we describe here uh, would make sense on a variety of different architectures, not just GPUs. Oh. Uh, so what we have in mind is something that looks like a GPU, has high memory bandwidth, has a, a wide uh, sort of SIMD vector architecture, but the same kind of lessons uh, would be applicable uh, in a variety of places. Okay, so the, the first thing uh, to take from this uh, lecture is that GPUs can do sparse matrix vector uh, multiplication very efficiently. Um, this might be a little surprising because uh, and, and we'll get to this later, but there is some inherent irregularity in matrix, sparse matrix vector products, or SPIMV for short. Uh, and that might make you believe that, well, you know, if I'm doing irregular memory accesses, I really need a nice, big, sophisticated cache to, to do this effectively. Uh, but in practice, the GPUs are, are, are quite effective at doing this, even though they don't have large caches. So the amount of cache we have per thread is quite small. Uh, in comparison to like a, a multi-core CPU. Uh, but that doesn't matter so much because the way that a, uh, a GPU deals with memory latency uh, is very different. It just has lots of threads uh, and it can hide that latency as opposed to uh, needing a cache in order to get a uh, effectively lower latency. Um, so we, we will make more trips to DRAM instead of hitting this cache like a, a CPU does, but that's okay because we have lots of threads uh, that we can schedule uh, while we're waiting for that uh, memory to get back to us. Um, so the, the performance that we're able to achieve is about a, a little over 10 gigaflops uh, on unstructured matrices. This might not sound like much if you're accustomed to seeing you know, hundreds of gigaflops or 300 gigaflops. Uh, but SPIMV is a bandwidth limited operation. Uh, rather than you know, SGM or, or FFT where we do lots of flops per uh, memory access, in SPIMV we do uh, two flops per element in the matrix. Uh, so the, the computational intensity or the amount of flops we do uh, per byte we read from memory is quite low. Uh, and therefore the, the limiting factor is the available memory bandwidth. Uh, but all that uh, aside, we can get a good fraction of the peak memory bandwidth available on the GPU. So on this GPU, this is a, uh, these results are for a, a GTX 285, uh, so it's not Fermi. Uh, Fermi is uh, quite a bit faster for these, but I don't have those numbers we can get a 140 gigabytes uh, a second of, of uh, actual you know, effective bandwidth. Uh, and that's, that's pretty close to the peak available on that uh, device. Um, one interesting thing about sparse matrix vector multiplication is that there's really no single approach that, it is, that will be best for this. Uh, when people say, what's the best sort, or what's the best you know, matrix matrix multiply approach, uh, you know, you can actually tailor something that's quite good. Maybe it depends a little on the size of the input. Uh, but in, in sparse matrix vector multiplication, it depends on not just the size of the matrix, uh, but its structure. And we can have a variety of different sparsity structures. Uh, you can have very regular structures for certain kinds of problems and completely irregular structures for uh, other ones. It just depends on the problem that you're solving. Uh, so we'll explore a few different matrix formats and, and approaches for those uh, matrix formats. And the, the general uh, uh, strategy here is that we want to sort of decompose what w the, the computation into a regular part that can be processed at, at high efficiency and is uh, really amenable for the GPU. And then we want to sort of se separate out the ir irregular part uh, if possible. So we want to do uh, the fast thing for the majority of the matrix if, if we can and the slower but maybe robust thing for uh, what's it, whatever is left over. 
So you don't just have to take everything and put it into a single matrix. You can sort of use a, a, a splitting in order to decompose that matrix into two parts. Okay, so if you're not familiar uh, with the operation, uh, when I say sparse matrix, I just mean a matrix where uh, a lot of the entries are, are, non, are, are exactly zero. So these you know, entries here would be the non-zeros of the matrix. Uh, and in practice, uh, you know, we, the, what, what is meant by sparse can vary from application to application, but you know, it is not uncommon to find a matrix that's say a million by a million, and in each row has maybe 10 entries or 100 entries. So by sparse, I mean uh, usually that the number of entries in a row is some constant, and then the matrix can be quite large. Uh, so we multiply the, the sparse matrix by a vector, uh, and you can kind of see the, the computational pattern here. We have to take each row, and we're multiplying, you know, so row by, by this column. So it requires that we do irregular access to this vector, and we call this the source vector. Uh, multiply it by an entry there, uh, sum them together, and then write it out to the uh, destination vector. So it's a, a sparse gather, uh, and then reduction, and then we write out. So you could implement this, uh, and people do, using some generic primitives like segmented scan. Uh, the performance of that will suffer a bit because it's not specialized for this. Uh, so it, it's, in our case, we, we you know, invest a little more effort to make this as fast as possible. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the uh, SPMD is memory bound. We do, it, you can just sort of count it. Uh, we'll access this element. We'll access you know, the corresponding element of the vector. So we're doing two reads. Uh, we multiply them together and then we'll add it to the same sort of uh, multiplied values in that row. So we do two floating point operations, and we have to read uh, two values for that. So very little computation going on, entirely limited by the memory bandwidth. Uh, okay, and you can sort of, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the kinds of numbers you can get out of a dense blast, so this would be like a, you know, if this was a dense matrix, uh, we would have a blast routine for it. That'll kind of establish an upper bound for what we can do here. Uh, so there's a dense, you know, matrix vector multiply. It's also bandwidth limited because it does very little computation per access. Uh, but because it's regular, uh, w we would be able to get higher performance in that case. Okay, so one question is, you know, why, why bother with SPIMV? Where does it arise? Uh, some of you, especially those with, like, engineering backgrounds, uh, will have used sparse solvers in the, in the past. Uh, things like conjugate gradient iteration, GM res, you know, there are dozens of these. Uh, in all of these cases, the, the core computation, you know, the, the real meat of the, the computation uh, boils down to this. Uh, if you do conjugate gradient iteration, uh, you'll do one spin V operation, then maybe a dot product or a vector vector uh, addition, uh, those kind of operations. But maybe 80 or 90 percent of the whole computation is just spin V operations. Uh, and this holds for uh, you know, pretty much all iterative methods. GM res also does these kinds of things. It does different vector operations. But in all cases, we have uh, sparse matrix vector multiplies. Um, there, you know, the thing that I usually have in mind is these iterative methods, but it also arises in, you know, plenty of other contexts. It may not be even, even like a numerical method. It may be uh, some kind of graph algorithm where the nodes in the graph, uh, you know, need to do some uh, local um, gather operation and then reduce that to a value. Uh, so it comes up in a lot of, of instances uh, aside from iterative methods. Um, but in the case of iter iterative methods, uh, in order to reach a solution, so we're solving AX equals B, uh, we might need to do uh, hundreds or thousands of spin V uh, operations. So it's very important that uh, it be as quick as possible. Okay. So the sparsity structure of the matrix, uh, you know, in this case, uh, we had this, this sparsity structure. You could tell it's symmetric. Uh, but often it's determined by the structure of some uh, mesh or computational grid. So here, this would be a, a regular grid. Uh, and if we imagine that the uh, unknowns of this matrix uh, correspond to the nodes of this mesh, you can see that most would have, say, uh, four neighbors. And if we ordered them uh, in the, the natural way, uh, then there's a certain amount of regularity in the matrix. Um, if you've used like uh, MATLAB before, there's this spdiags command, and that would give you the ability to generate a sparse matrix for that kind of uh, mesh. On the other hand, we might have a, a regular uh, 
mesh, in this case a, a 2D triangle mesh. And in here, the number of neighbors of each, uh, of, of each vertex varies. So we have some with six, maybe some with seven, some with five, uh, and so on. And in 3D, we might get you know, a completely different sort of distribution. Uh, but it's important, because both of these uh, arise in practice, it's important to be able to handle both the highly structured case and also the very unstructured case. Actually, this one has more structure than some that we might be interested in. If you have a matrix that encodes you know, uh, links in the, the internet or something, like a page rank matrix, uh, then it will be even more challenging than this one to uh, uh, process efficiently. Okay. So the objectives when you want to implement uh, SPIMV on the GPU, you need to find you know, thousands of independent threads of, of work. You know, if you implement SPIMV on a, a multi-core, it's pretty straightforward. You just do what you would do for each row, and then you divide the rows over the number of processors, and that, that's usually sufficient. Um, but on the GPU, there's some other challenges uh, that arise. Uh, you need to minimize the uh, execution divergence. So if we have some variance in the amount of work per row, if we divide, you know, say we, pr we assign uh, one row per, per thread, uh, then if we do that in the, the amount of work per row differs, uh, we're going to get some idle threads. And this can actually be a, a big uh, performance penalty. Uh, the more pressing concern is the memory access divergence. So we can't just have our threads going off into memory uh, and reading independently. If we can avoid that, we definitely want to. Because as we uh, spoke about last week, or, or on Tuesday, uh, coalesced memory access is a lot more efficient than uncoalesced access. Uh, so these are the, the primary considerations uh, we'll make in, in designing these SPIMV kernels. Okay, so in our, our paper, we looked at a, a variety of different matrix formats. Uh, you know, they, they usually have abbreviations like uh, DIA or ELL and, and, and so on. And the idea is that some of them are, are tailored for the structured case. So the leftmost one is the, uh, it is stored, you know, it's the, sort of the perfect case for this diagonal format. And here, this is a pretty much random matrix. Uh, so there's really no you know, uh, regularity in this at all uh, that we can exploit uh, in the matrix structure. Uh, and there are things that, that vary between. This is not really a, a firm sort of uh, spectrum. Uh, it's just to illustrate that there are those on the left-hand side that are uh, you know, tailored for structured matrices, and there are other uh, formats that are better for unstructured matrices. And if you have structure in your problem, then uh, you'll definitely want to exploit it. Uh, if you have something that can be stored in this diagonal format, it's going to be very, very fast. Uh, you know, there's, there's very little irregularity in that computation. Uh, a very common and, and general format on the CPU is this uh, compressed sparse row, or, or CSR format. And the way this works, it's pretty simple. Uh, you just take each row and you lay it out in a, in a big vector. Uh, so in the first row, we have three elements. Uh, there's a, a, a couple zero entries, and we just have the three non-zero elements here. In the second row, we have four, so we lay them out next. Uh, there's a, a single entry in the third row, and, and so on. And in addition to this, uh, we'll have another structure that points to the beginning of each row. So you can index into the beginning of each row with uh, a single uh, operation in constant time, and then the number, the, the elements of that row uh, are, are determined uh, you know, just by looking at two of those pointers. So you can get the beginning and end of a row uh, very easily, and then you know exactly what you need to process. Um, the problem with this kind of format is that it's not really convenient for what we want to do. Uh, we can process with it. It's very simple. You can just assign one thread per row. Uh, but it, it's inconvenient because it doesn't really let us know uh, ahead of time what we want to process. Uh, question? Sir, in this format, how do you know which column the thing was in? Okay. So you, I, I, I guess I've, I've simplified it too much. Uh, you'd have one linear vector like this for the non-zero entries, and then you'd have another one, you know, uh, equivalent to it with the column indices in it. Uh, you could store them interleaved if you wanted, but it's customary to use two different uh, arrays. Okay, so the simplest approach, uh, we call this the CSR scalar approach, and scalar because it uses one thread per row, is just to take each thread and have it index into the uh, CSR structure at the beginning of that row, and then proceed serially. So thread zero and thread one and so on will access these uh, elements 
in the matrix uh, at, in their first iteration, and then they'll proceed uh, reading left to right. Uh, you know, thread two only has one element, so it doesn't uh, iterate anymore. Uh, but you should see that this is, uh, actually this case is not too terrible, but you can imagine as these rows grow, we get absolutely no memory coalescing at all. You know, if these rows are, are 16 elements long, no coalescing whatsoever. Uh, so we want to do better than this. Uh, in addition to being, you know, uncoalesced, there's no alignment considerations here at all. We, we just index into the vector and we uh, accept wherever that starts. Uh, so this is, we can do this, and I'll show some performance numbers for it, uh, but it's really the most naive thing. And it's, I guess, what you did in one of your earlier MPs. Uh, but there are much better approaches to this uh, CSR uh, multiply. And uh, one such approach is to not use a single thread per row, but to use a, uh, a whole warp. So the warp is, you know, the basic unit of uh, execution, and on a uh, NVIDIA GPUs, these are 32 threads wide. And this is somewhat wasteful because, you know, we're only using, say, three threads of this 32 thread warp, but at least we're getting memory coalescing, and that's the dominant concern here. We have a lot of wasted threads, but the very first, the, the more important optimization here is how efficiently are we accessing memory. Uh, if these rows are, say, 32 elements long or longer, uh, then this approach is actually pretty good. Uh, we're using all our threads, and they're getting good memory coalescing uh, when they access the uh, CSR structure. Um, okay. uh, I, I guess I also have a note that this is unaligned. Uh, so because we don't have any you know, consideration for you know, where these alignment boundaries would be, we just uh, naively go out into memory. Uh, you know, this access will be coalesced but unaligned. So if we have long rows, uh, they will be unaligned, even though we're getting good coalescing otherwise. Uh, an alternative to that is uh, this LPAC structure. Uh, in LPAC, we take the matrix and uh, we, we lay it out like this, and we'll just pad out. So in this case, the, there's a row that has four entries that determines uh, the maximum that we have to store. And then we essentially pad out uh, the rows that have fewer than, than four entries. Um, another thing we can do is store this in column major order. So rather than being stored, uh, you know, a normal C ordering, we'll store it uh, in column ordering. And if we use the same kind of approach where we assign one thread per row, uh, you can uh, sort of convince yourself that this will actually access the matrix structure uh, in a coalesced way. And if we pad out the bottom of this matrix to a multiple of 16, uh, then it will actually access it in a coalesced and aligned way. Uh, so this is a way of taking a, a matrix, and, and this, of course, doesn't work if, you know, this kind of assumption doesn't uh, apply. But when we can apply this kind of uh, matrix structure to the, the problem you have, uh, then it, that it is, is highly efficient. Um, in many cases, say we have that uh, mesh we saw earlier in 2D, the irregular triangle mesh, uh, because the average uh, number of, of uh, non-zeros in a row is pretty close to the maximum. We won't have to, you know, insert too many, uh, too much fill into this uh, LPAC structure, and we can process that pretty efficiently. Um, but of course, there's a weakness here that if one row has an exceptional number of non-zeros in it, you know, say if we had a row with a hundred and most of them have three, then this kind of structure is a, a very poor choice. So the the solution we have for that, uh, it's pretty simple is just to select some typical number. In this case, we decided let's store two non-zeros per row, the first two non-zeros per row in the LPAC structure, and then store whatever is left over in a coordinate format. Uh, I didn't describe the coordinate format. It's very simple. Uh, all we do is lay out the non-zeros in a vector. So we've selected these four uh, in blue. And then we also have a vector for the row entries of those and a, a vector for the column entries. So we have three vectors. And it's pretty much the, the simplest format you can imagine. Uh, we'll have an approach for this uh, that I won't describe in, in detail. You can refer to our code or the, the paper for the, the details. But it's based on a, a segmented reduction. Uh, and the idea there is that uh, the computation we do, we do a little bit more work than we have to do for this kind of approach. Uh, but it, it is ro very robust. So whether the rows have lots of entries or a small number of entries, uh, the, the sort of performance we get out of that is about the same. Uh, whereas with LPAC or CSR, uh, there's going to be some irregularity there. 
Okay. Uh, another thing to, to keep in mind is that different approaches, uh, and, and we've looked at a few now, uh, have different amounts of parallelism. Uh, the first one we looked at, the CSR scalar, as I said, has uh, one thread per row. And that's usually enough. If your matrix has you know, tens of thousands of, of rows, that, that ought to be enough parallelism. Uh, the diagonal approach, which I haven't shown, and the LPAC uh, kernel, which I'll show later, uh, they also have one thread per row, and that's usually enough. Um, sometimes, though, we'll have a matrix which has maybe uh, relatively few rows. could have a lot of non-zeros because it might have a huge number of columns. And for those kind of, of, of situations, you want something that sh which exposes more parallelism. So the CSR vector, uh, because it's using one warp as opposed to one thread per row, actually has you know, about 32 times as much parallelism in, in some cases. Uh, the coordinate kernel, uh, which uses this segmented reduction, which is similar to segmented scan, uh, actually develops one thread per non-zero. So the expectations on your problem, uh, you know, if you have a very small matrix, then something like COO may be faster uh, because it, it has more threads uh, for, for small matrices. The ones on the top are, are usually good enough in practice, uh, but I'll, I'll show a, a slide now where uh, we can see the trade-off between those. So in this case, I'm, I'm illustrating uh, a, a variety of different matrices, and each of these matrices is actually a dense matrix. I just stored it in a sparse for format. And with these matrices, they're all, they all have four million entries in them. I'm just changing the shape. Uh, so in some cases, on, all the way on the left, I have a matrix with one row and four million columns. And all the way on the right, I have a matrix with uh, one column and four million rows. And as you can see, you know, the amount of work here is, is approximately the same. Same amount of uh, flops need to be computed. Uh, they just expose more and less parallelism uh, for different kernels. Uh, one thing to note is that this COO, it provides pretty much constant performance. As I said, it's very robust and insensitive to the distribution of, of non-zero. So even in these weird cases on the extreme uh, ends, it it's provides about the same performance. Uh, the other thing to note is that uh, you see this gray curve. Uh, this is the CSR vector. And you can see that it peaks about when we get to uh, 1,000 rows. And the reason for this is that once we get to about 1,000 rows, we've developed about 32,000 threads, and that's about the amount that will fit on uh, this particular GPU. Uh, likewise, when we get to this uh, purple curve with the LPAC kernel, uh, it's developing one uh, thread per, per row. So about when we get to 20 or 30,000 rows, we filled the machine again. Uh, so it, it's you know, in practice, we have at least this many rows. Uh, if you're doing PDEs or something, it, it's very unlikely you'd be on that side. So maybe it doesn't matter so much. Uh, but in some extreme cases, we'll want to use these more robust strategies uh, because they develop lots of parallelism, even if the number of rows is small. Uh, the CSR scalar approach, uh, you know, this is the worst uh, uh, kernel we have, and we just have it for comparison. Uh, you can see that it, it's a pretty much a bad approach across the board until we get into very small rows. And when we have very small rows, uh, you know, rows with very few entries in them, then we're going to get you know, some fortuitous coalescing. The threads will be nearby when they access the CSR structure. And so the performance will be a little bit better then. OK. Uh, so the previous slide. I illustrated some cases where we had more or less parallelism, and certain kernels need more rows in order to have enough parallelism to fill the device. Uh, you can also get into trouble if the kernel that you have uh, has, is sensitive to the row size. So in CSR Scalar, the, the first kernel I presented, each thread processed serially. So if we have some rows that are very long, some that are very short, uh, some of those threads are going to be idle and just waiting around. Uh, there are more robust strategies like the COO approach where the, uh, the work we do is completely insensitive to the uh, distribution of row sizes. Uh, so it, it does not matter how the, the matrix, uh, the, the sparsity pattern of the matrix uh, appears. Uh, so in this case, you, you can kind of ignore this. Uh, the, the main point of this graph is just that we have some matrices and they have uh, wildly different variants. So I plotted the variants here and the, uh, and the dashed line plots the variance for each of these matrices. And on the extreme left, we have very high variance in the uh, row lengths. Um, and you can get this if you're doing, say, 
uh, a web adjacency matrix. You might be on the left side of this graph. And you can see here that the coordinate approach uh, has very stable performance, uh, but both of the CSR kernels kind of suffer. Um, as we move to the right and we get less variant, so on the right-hand side, the rows will have approximately the same number of entries, uh, we get you know, better performance out of these two CSR kernels. Uh, so if you have lots of ir irregularity in your matrix, then the robust kind of strategy uh, pays off. Um, in addition to execution divergence, so execution is just having idle threads because they've reached the end of the, the work they have to process. Uh, there's also memory access divergence. So I mean things that, uh, that provide uh, poor coalescing or no coalescing at all. Uh, and as I mentioned before, um, CSR scalar has, has very little opportunities for co coalescing. CSR vector has some because we're accessing uh, rows with a, a single warp. And the other kernels, the diagonal or LPAC, are fully coalesced. So when we read data from the matrix, uh, we're going to do so in the most ideal fashion. Uh, so this will be very efficient. Uh, one way to sort of understand this, and this is not a, a sparse matrix operation. Uh, it's a, a just a, we're adding two vectors. This is like the Saxby and Daxby operations in BLAST. And the reason I plot this is that it's, it's very easy to see the trade-off between the stride. Uh, so if I have stride of one, that means I'm just taking two vectors and adding them together uh, and, and storing the result. Uh, if I have a stride of two, that means I'm reading, say, the even elements of that vector and the even elements of another vector, summing them together and writing them out. So when I access these vectors with, with larger and larger strides, I get worse and worse performance. It's basically, you know, one over stride performance until I get out here and it's basically flat. So the, the purpose of this slide is to show you that if you read, you know, on, with these uh, highly structured formats, like the LPAC structure or the diagonal structure, you get this 140. Like this is basically near the peak bandwidth that you can get on the device. As soon as you do anything that's non-unit stride, as soon as your threads are, are reading slightly apart in memory, uh, you're going to very quickly drop into this regime. Uh, and, and basically get something like one-tenth the peak uh, performance. So this is why it pays to optimize first for uh, memory coalescing and then second for pretty much everything else. Okay, now I'll present some performance results. Uh, these are all taken on the GeForce GTX 285. Uh, I should really update this with some Fermi numbers. I'll get around to that soon. Uh, we're using the texture cache. Uh, one thing I kind of ignored in the previous slides is that we have to do these random gather operations from that input vector. And we really have no control over how that happens. So we're going to access through the texture cache and just hope that we get some fortuitous uh, reuse out of those values. Um, I'm going to use double precision for all these. Single precision will be faster, not because the you know, floating point uh, throughput is higher, but just because the values are smaller and it requires less memory bandwidth to read them. Uh, and we'll look at two classes of matrices, structured matrices, so things that are defined on regular grids, uh, and unstructured matrices, so things defined on irregular meshes uh, or things that aren't defined on a computational mesh at all. Okay, so here we can see the performance using uh, different stencils. So these are, are 1, 2, and 3D problems. Uh, so this is a 27-point stencil. That just means that if you looked at the grid, uh, that you are using, the nodes would be connected to all 27 of their 3D neighbors. Uh, and this is a nine-point stencil in 2D. So these are very basic sort of uh, finite difference operations, uh, but they, they illustrate the kind of trade-offs you get uh, and the performance you can expect from different uh, SPIMBY kernels. So you can see here, uh, the diagonal and the LPAC formats are the best for this, uh, and we get great performance there. Uh, the Diagonal is a better representation because it doesn't have to store the column indices. Uh, so it has a little bit less uh, uh, information to read in order to compute the values. Um, down here you can see the other formats. The uh, COO provides pretty stable performance across the board. But we can see there's a big difference between what we can do with the coordinate format and what we get out of the LPAC format. Uh, so that's why when we do the hybrid matrix, uh, we'll prefer to put entries into that LPAC structure and put as few as possible into the coordinate structure. Uh, and then you can see the CSR kernels. Um, CSR scalar uh, decreases a little as the um, 
the number of entries per row increases just because we're getting less uh, coalescing. Uh, and the CSR vector kind of improves a bit. And if we considered larger matrices, it would improve, continue to improve. Uh, so unstructured matrices are probably the more interesting case. Uh, again, we can see that the coordinate uh, in this light blue has pretty stable performance. And the, that's kind of impressive because these matrices come from all different domains. Uh, the ones prefixed with FEM are finite element matrices. So usually I think these are, are 3D uh, meshes are derived from 3D meshes. Over here we get some other domains like this web base is a, a web adjacency matrix. Uh, here we have like a circuit simulation matrix. Uh, and this is a, a linear programming matrix. Uh, so these are more challenging. Uh, they have less regularity. Uh, they're quite uh, difficult for some of these formats to, to process. And, and that's where the coordinate structure is uh, you know, most appealing. Um, the hybrid structure, the one that splits the matrix into the two parts, the LPAC structure and the coordinate structure, uh, is our best performing uh, choice in most cases, especially in the finite element uh, matrices. And the way that we decide how, what entries to put in one side and what entries to put in the, the coordinate side is just basically a, a simple heuristic of that we want to store as many as possible in, in LPAC but we are unwilling to insert them if we have to add too much fill. So at some point we decide, well, I could add a kth entry uh, per row to the LPAC, but it would be too wasteful, so I don't do it anymore. Uh, so it's a very simple heuristic, but it does uh, select the right number uh, in most of these cases, uh, and then the performance is, is quite good. Um, I'll also show some performance results compared to other platforms. Uh, the cell we include because there was a, a really nice paper at supercomputing uh, a few years ago, uh, which was kind of surprising because it considered a variety of different platforms. Back then it was like a Core 2, uh, Intel Core 2, and uh, AMD uh, multi-core. Uh, it also had, it had cell um, and also a uh, Sun Niagara. So it had a lot of different multi-threaded systems. Uh, and of those, cell was the, uh, provided the highest performance even though it didn't have a nice big cache. You know, you actually have to do quite a bit of work to get uh, your memory uh, to and from the, the floating point pipelines on cell. Uh, so we compared to that, and we also compared to a uh, you know, core i7 quad core uh, using Intel's MKL library. And here's the results. So the results here for the GPU are just the, the best result I had on the previous slide, uh, which is generally the, the hybrid format. And you can see that the cell, uh, it was very fast in, in 2007, the fastest one tested. Uh, it still beats the uh, Core i7, but uh, it just doesn't have enough memory bandwidth to really rival the GPU. Uh, we have you know, two or three times as much memory bandwidth, uh, so we have a, a raw performance advantage here. Uh, the Core i7, uh, it has a lot more memory bandwidth than previous generations, like the Core 2, uh, but still only provides about, say, two to three uh, gigaflops in most of these cases. So we have maybe you know, a four to six X uh, performance advantage uh, uh, in, in many of these cases. Um, so that's the, the performance and that should convince you why you ought to write you know, kernels on the GPU to do these kinds of operations. Here's a, a slide that shows that it's actually not so difficult to do. This is the uh, ELL kernel. So this is a, a regular uh, it makes regular access to the matrix. But you can see it's really not so complicated. And this is very similar. Uh, the code I use in the, the library uh, that I got these results for is templated. All I've done here is just insert uh, double for the, the type to, to make it easier to read. And this is pretty much the, the kernel that I use. Uh, it's very simple. You can see here this is where the accumulation is happening. Uh, we go off into memory. Maybe some of the uh, addressing arithmetic is, is hard to follow in real time. but very similar to the, the kind of thing you might write if you were doing a for loop. All we've done is sort of uh, translated that to CUDA using you know, the standard idioms. Um, we also have a, a library called CUSP that we're working on. Some of you may have already experimented with this. Uh, and you'll notice it's kind of like Thrust in that we don't have any explicit calls to CUDA. We've hidden that all behind some uh, C++ interface. Uh, and this is an example that shows how to read a matrix from a file uh, into, and convert it to this HYB, the hybrid format, 
and then set up a linear system, Ax equals uh, b, and solve it using the conjugate gradient method. Uh, so this is uh, pretty simple to use. Um, right now we just have a uh, conjugate gradient iteration and a by CG stab solver. Uh, but if you wanted to do this kind of thing with your project, then it might be a good starting point uh, for you because we have you know, the ability to read files and get things on the GPU pretty quickly. Uh, there are a lot of other directions and improvements you can make uh, to the kernels I presented. Uh, in a lot of problems, instead of having just, say, one unknown on each node of your mesh, you might have several. It could be like a 3D vector. And when you have that kind of situation, the non-zeros in the matrix won't just be scattered about. They'll actually occur in small, dense blocks. So if it's a 3D vector, it's not uncommon to have little 3x3 three three blocks in your matrix. And taking advantage of that, uh, can give you quite a bit better performance. You're allowed to uh, eliminate the column indices for those blocks because they're all, you know, easily computed from the others. Uh, and it allows you to sort of uh, optimize your access to the source vector. Uh, so those are both things that you can take advantage of. Uh, some other people have worked on a, a block LPAC, which is uh, similar but uh, a little bit uh, more structured. Uh, and they get maybe 30% better performance than us in some of those finite element cases. Uh, the other thing that you can do, in all the cases I've presented, we looked at just a, a matrix vector. But in many cases, you might want to solve multiple systems at the same time or have some other reason to compute uh, a matrix times uh, a series of vectors all at once. And in that case, you can get better performance because you have to read the matrix entry once, but you get to compute several different uh, uh, vector products with that. Uh, so you get to sort of amortize that cost over several vectors instead of just one. Um, you know, this might call, come up if you're solving multiple right-hand sides, as I said, or there's a class of, of uh, solvers where you use uh, a series of vectors in order to solve a single right-hand side. Uh, there are other optimizations, like you can just simply have a, a better implementation of this CSR vector. Uh, the code I have now in the cusp is actually a, a little bit faster than the stuff I presented today. Uh, but you can imagine a lot of other improvements. Uh, just at the, the basic level of the either format or the uh, kernel than what we have now. Uh, there are a few papers if you're interested in this, uh, if you want to specialize it. Like in some cases, you don't actually need the non-zero values. The non-zeros of the matrix may all be one, so you just eliminate that from your kernel. And if that's the case, you might just take our code and, and eliminate part of it. Uh, if you want to do other sorts of things, uh, these are some papers that uh, you may find useful. Um, this is the paper that I mentioned where they considered the uh, matrix blocking uh, and got a, a performance improvement. Uh, this paper examines some improvements to the CSR kernel. Uh, and the top two are, are some that we've written on the, to discuss these kernels. Okay, so that concludes my talk. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions now. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.